Hey, welcome into Candlestick Chronicles, a 49ers podcast on the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Kyle Madsen. I write about the 49ers over at NinersWire.com, part of the USA Today Sports Media Group. Joining me now, Chris Biederman, and boy, that was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> uh, shout out to our friends at Cooperage. Shout out to our friends at Lamb Chops. Uh, Lamb Chops, of course, the official clothing brand of Candlestick Chronicles. And you can go to sglamchops.com right now and get yourself decked out in a hoodie. You can get yourself decked out in some sick ass shorts or some sweats or t shirts, whatever you want. They got their fall and winter line. And a huge congrats to them, by the way. They partnered with the Minnesota Timberwolves and uh, they had their launch at the team store at the Timberwolves Arena and it went crazy. Like there were lines out the door, it sold out, everything sold out in five minutes. Uh, just incredibly successful for them. We love to see it, and we love that uh, they are a sponsor, and we love Lamb Chops. Candlestick20 is the promo what? code, by the way. 20% off. was rocking my Lamb Chop sweat shorts with the zippered pockets all throughout the game. Perfect loungewear, uh, mm. especially when it's cold and rainy outside. Yeah. Exceedingly comfortable for the couch. And you know what? It also looks good out and about. Um, sure when I, whenever I wear my lamb chops, I, I get a lot of compliments. So yeah. may, make sure you check out their websites and uh, and cop some good stuff because it's it's great quality. It's comfortable and uh, and as my dad, know, Kyle looks. My, yeah, it does look dope. Uh, my dad rolled over to watch the game tonight in his lamb chop sweats, and I was like rocking the lamb chops. He's like, dude, they're the best. They're the best sweatpants I own. I'm like, damn. All right, shout out. And he just said that to me. He's he's not even like out and about endorsing that. He already knows I know. But he still, uh, he loves him a lot, and I know you will too. Go to sglambchops.com. Follow them on uh, Instagram at sglambchops for, for looks at their latest styles. And I use that promo code CANDLESTICK20. Get 20% off your order today. We're also sponsored by Cooperage Brewing. That's the home of Candlestick Chronicles Hazy IPA. I cracked one open uh, at some point in the third quarter because it was like, you know what? I'm going to need this. There's a lot. There's a lot happening. And you know what? It's been uh, it's been great. It is so delicious. Not only great in the summertime when you want a crisp, refreshing beer to drink, but you know what? It's also good when it's pissing rain outside and very cold. It's uh, delicious then it as well, it turns out. Uh, sources have told this podcast that Candlestick Chronicles Hazy IPA is available in Noe Valley in San Francisco. If you're if you're in the area, I'm not Ooh. I'm not entirely sure which store. Um, but if, if you know of a, of a good store to buy some craft brews in, in Noe Valley and, uh, in, in the city, go check it out and, uh, and you'll find some. And obviously, look, we, we talk about Cooperage every episode. It's your favorite, favorite breweries, favorite brewery up in Santa Rosa. Um, yeah. obviously there are a lot of very high profile names when it comes to the craft brew scene in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County. And they all know about Cooperage and a lot of them go hang out and drink at Cooperage after they're done brewing their own beer because they appreciate how good it is. Um, so you should too, whether you're in Santa Rosa, um, stop by, stop by the brewery there or order it online or check it out in, uh, in a local establishment if you can find it and, uh, and enjoy it because it's delicious and everything they make is good from the wheat beers to the double California IPAs. Like it's, it's all good stuff. Shout out Cooperage, cooperagebrewing.com. You can get a case shipped right to your front door. Just be in the state of California, 21 or older, 24 beers arriving at your door. You sign for it. You got beer at your front door. It's the very best thing. All right. <clears throat> Shout out to Cooperage. We love them. And let's talk about this wild ass 49ers win that kind of feels like a loss. I don't know. Let's dive in. <laughs> what a weird game. I don't know how they, it doesn't to me fit like, they they got their asses kicked. The 49ers did. And at the end of the game, they were just a, a little bit better. And that is... I got... I, I don't even know where to start. That was crazy. So, it was crazy. Um, we've talked all year about how the 49ers have sort of run away and hid in most of their games this season. Right? Mm -hmm. They'll just, like, jump on you early, and then they'll just pound you into submission as the game goes right. on right. and end up winning comfortably by, by double digits. Right. I kind of thought that's how this game was going to go. Um, and it ended up being one of those games that the type of game that like we've seen the Eagles win, right? Like mm -hmm. the Eagles throughout the first half of the year would sort of play down to their opponent, not be super crisp, but just win all these games. And over time, all the metrics would say, yeah, the record's probably not really indicative of how good they are. Mm -hmm. um, while the 49ers, when they've had games where they haven't played well, 
where they've lost guys to injuries or they turn the ball over or all the above, they've just lost those games. And, mm-hmm. you know, they were <laughs> the, the big stat coming out of tonight. The 49ers got their first win when trailing by five or more going into the fourth quarter um, under Kyle Shanahan. They're one in 30, uh, w- which is insane to think about. But also, you know, they kicked a field goal. I think with like four seconds into the fourth quarter. Yeah. Um, so they weren't down by five for long, but still the stat stands. And, um, and it's just one of those games that the 49ers won ugly. And that felt kind of similar to, you know, one of those games that, that they would have lost early in the season. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they got a little bit lucky. Um, but look like the fact that they probably put together, I would say, a C minus performance overall. Oh, God. And that, still that might won be generous. and got and got to the <laughs> NFC championship game yeah. is a win. And you just hope, you know, I don't know if it was the weather. And again, I'm, I wouldn't use the weather as an excuse for Brock Purdy, sure. but I think it's pretty clear that his physical limitations are exasperated when the weather is bad. Exacerbated? Weather, like Yeah. You said exasperated. Like, exacerbated yeah did i what you said exasperated i don't think i did his physical anyway. you did check the tape chat okay. tell him tell him youtube chat anyway sorry keep going doesn't matter i think uh i think that you know the the fact that he, i mean he just struggles to throw in the rain i yep. think that's pretty clear now uh and so you know looking at this at the schedule or at the forecast the 10-day forecast it looks like it's supposed to be dry next Sunday. Um, again, we will have plenty of time and, and that could change. But I just think like, you know, the small hands, the not super strong arm, you know, we'll talk about Brock Purdy at length, but he, he just wasn't sharp. Um, and the 49ers offense hasn't been sharp all years when they've lost Debo Samuel. It just feels like they're they're a little bit rudderless for, for whatever reason, even though they mm-hmm. still have a ton of talent when even when Debo Samuel sideline. Um, so I just think, uh, whoops, wrong comment. Anyway, I just think, um, <laughs> that <laughs> the chat's going off right now. I just think that, um, it was one of those games that, that maybe the 49ers were due to win, right? Like one of those sure. games that, that a lot of other teams, you know, this this felt like watching the 2022 Vikings win a game. This felt like watching the Eagles of the first half of this year mm. win a game. And and the 49ers, when they've been in that scenario and and just don't play well, they've they've typically lost. And they came out of today with again like a C minus D plus performance and won a game and advanced in the playoffs. And all, ultimately, that's all that really matters. And they'll still be heavy favorites going in the NFC Championship game, whether it's Detroit or whether it's Tampa Bay. But and as we'll talk about tonight and as the week goes forward, there's plenty, plenty of areas to improve for this team because that was not as strong of a showing as you would hope for for a team that we thought had a chance to be sort of historically good as the season wore on, given the talent of the roster and everything else. Yeah, it, it's it, it, it's weird because usually in a game like this where, okay, you the team wasn't playing well and then they wind up winning, there's a point where you go, okay, that was like the turning point. That was where they kind of figured it out. But there were just a lot of li- – there wasn't one big play. The missed field goal, obviously, by, by Green Bay, by Anders Carlson, the 41-yarder, was obviously huge. But, like, plays the 49ers made, there's so many little plays that stick out. Like even Purdy on the last drive, he goes five of six for 47 yards. But Brandon Ayuk had two unbelievable catches on that drive. The third and nine, where he had to reach down and behind himself to catch it off his shoe tops, is an incredible play. There was the third and five or six where he had the diving contested catch. It's an incredible play. And those kind of things, like just keeping drives alive like that, kind of throughout the game and throughout the second half, like those just little things kind of add up. But Brock Purdy scrambled, like made it a, they went from second and what were they? They had a, before the scramble, they had a second and 10 and he scrambles for nine yards to make it third and one. Now that opens the whole playbook. That allows McCaffrey to run up the middle for, for six yards and a touchdown. And I think that's why when I look back at this game, it's like, man, they did a lot of things wrong and they did a lot of things poorly. And when you look at everything in that game, they probably should have lost, but I mean, they're really talented. They have a lot of very, very good players 
And George Kittle came up with a couple of big plays. Christian McCaffrey came up with a couple of big plays. It was Brandon Ayuk. Jawan Jennings had a really nice game. Um, Fred Warner was running around defensively. Diamador Lenore was excellent. So I, I think when you just start kind of stacking up, um, Dre Greenlaw, of course, had the two interceptions. It was just kind of the 49ers talent level was just overwhelming enough to get them a win. And that's great in, in the divisional round. You, you win and you're onto the NFC title game. But that's just not going to work in, in in the next one or two games. Yeah, I, w- I would agree. Um, you know, some of those passes were like similar passes to what well, we'll talk about the Jennings handoff. Um, <laughs> Will some, we? <laughs> of the, some of the passes um, tonight that didn't get intercepted were ones that like the Ravens intercepted, for example. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's that's clearly the difference. And and like there was the 49ers absolutely caught some breaks. Right. Like I thought mm-hmm. on the fourth down quarterback sneak in the first half where the Packers went for it. I thought it was a bad spot and that he got it, but the 49ers were pretty lucky in that there wasn't visible proof on replay that showed the ball beyond the line to gain. Mm -hmm. And that ends up taking points off the board. Obviously it's a three point win. If the Packers even settle for a field goal there, uh, that, that, you know, the, the game is drastically different. Mm-hmm. Um, there were the dropped interceptions. There was the missed field goal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the 49ers did, did get fortunate and, mm-hmm. and sometimes that's, that's what it takes. Um, but to your point, like they, they do have to play a lot better, right? They, they just yeah. the, defensively, there was one point, um, where they allowed the Packers to convert, uh, six of nine third downs. And I think that that was in, in that stat was from the middle of the third quarter, um, mm-hmm when the Packers scored a couple of touchdowns and, and took the lead, um, they finished seven to 13. So they, they, they only went one for their last four on third down and the Niners defense as bad as it felt throughout the majority of the game, the mm-hmm. Packers last four, um, last four possessions after scoring the two touchdowns on consecutive drives to open the second half mm-hmm. when interception punt missed field goal interception. Yeah. Um, so the defense was bad for, probably 79% of the game. It felt like, mm-hmm. even though the numbers that, you know, the Packers numbers weren't like amazing, but it felt like, I mean, uh, Aaron Jones, I think he, the, the broadcast said it was the first time in 51 games, the 49ers had allowed an a hundred, a hundred yard rusher, The like yeah. the running game, the, the run defense wasn't particularly good. Um, the Niners didn't sack Jordan love, which is pretty problematic. Um, yeah. And it didn't yeah. even feel like he was pressured all that much. I, I like for, for a team, that's built like that relies so heavily on its defensive line. Mm-hmm. And when you have Logan Ryan and Tayshawn Gibson playing safety, you need to get more pressure than the 49ers did. And you need to help your defense out by, you know, getting obviously getting in more long yardage situations with sacks. And that they just didn't, wasn't happening. Highly, I thought for sure. I thought for sure they were going to blitz just a shitload. Like I thought they were going to blitz a lot against a, a young quarterback in his first year as a starter in his first divisional playoff game, they had a lot of looks where they would they would pack the line and then everybody would drop out and they would just rush four. Yeah. And I, I thought they did an okay job getting him to move around and getting him off his spot. There was a third and two late in the game where they forced him to throw behind Aaron Jones because they, he never got comfortable in the pocket and had to move around. But to credit credit to Jordan Love, he made a couple of throws, particularly in the first half, where I mean, he evaded a sack and then turned it into a big play down the field. So the play I, where he hit Dobbs, like Dobbs dusted Ambry Thomas, which was a theme. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and then Jordan Love rolled left, and I think it was it converted like a third and eleven, yeah, or something. And, and I think it was early in the third quarter that led to one of the touchdowns. Yeah, um, that was a dime. Like Love, Love is good. Like I'm, I'm pretty He's, impressed by him. I was too. Um, Except and some for that of their, last throw, and, I don't know what the last throw was. Yeah, I mean that was if spot. Greenlaw didn't grab that. Fred Warner was. Yeah, that's a tough we'll throw. But no, Fred I was Warner. I was super I was super impressed by by Jordan Love today. He was really really good. And Matt Lafleur, I thought yeah. Matt Lafleur was excellent. Steve Wilkes got got his pants coached off. <laughs> that was tough. But they yeah. came up. I mean, I you know you say all that. And it's true, like a hundred percent. But also, like credit where it's due, the Niners had the two red zone stops that forced field goals early on. That's yep. enormous. 
And then you just mentioned the biggest, the biggest drives of the game. They're getting, they're forcing the Packers to settle for a long field goal. They're getting punts. They're getting turnovers. And that's like, that's how in, I, I hate, I hate saying this because it's, it's intangible. And there's like, no, I don't think there's like real empirical data, but like experience matters, man. We talked about it a lot, just a cross sport reference here. The 40, uh, the, the Warriors and Kings playoff series last year. It's like, yeah, the Kings might be better in a vacuum, but the Warriors have been here. And mm -hmm. yeah, the Packers might have might have played better today, but the Niners have been here. And in the biggest spots, the Niners had dudes that made plays. And and the Packers yeah. did not. So uh, it's I'm yeah, interested to I, I see. Thought, oh, go ahead. No, I just I agree with everything you said. Um I just like the and this is uh, an aside, but like Ambry Thomas was just bad. Like it was, was probably his worst bad. game of the season. Yeah. Like the two PIs, um, obviously the one that basically converted, what was it? A third and 15. Yeah. Uh, and 41 they, and yard then they penalty. Got touched on. Um, I thought the Niners safeties weren't particularly good for most of the game. Yeah. And for the life of me, I couldn't understand why Logan Ryan, a guy who they signed late in the season, who was on a cruise in what October, or whatever that was, like he's starting a playoff game when you have Jair Brown healthy. I understand Jair Brown's a rookie and he's been out for a while, but like baffling. There's, there's no. I, that was just one of those decisions that I just didn't understand at all. Um, and it was pretty clear, like once the Packers knew that Ambry Thomas was was not having a great game, they they made a pretty concerted effort to pick on him, whether it would be running a bubble screen to his side or attacking him down the field. Like there were missed mm -hmm. tackles in addition to coverage bus. Yep. It wasn't a great Ambry Thomas game. Um, and I wonder now, like, I just don't know, like Logan, you, you had Tayshawn Gibson falling over. Also like they fell down, you know, the lot. Niners on their home feet there. Yeah. The Niners on their home field should not be slipping like that in the rain. Yeah. Right. Like the Niners grass is, is considered one of the best playing surfaces in the league. I get it was raining, but it felt like the Niners were slipping a hell of a lot more than the Packers were like, that's just, I don't know what that, what that is, if that's an equipment thing. Um, but it, it's something that probably shouldn't happen on your home field, even if it is raining. Like if it's, if it's happening to both teams, I get it. But if, if the Packers have like an equipment advantage and I don't know that they do necessarily, but just, I don't know. I thought that was a weird thing. Um, but again, I'll come back to the Niners have all this cap space, right? And I know Jimmy Ward's hurt right now. But man, if they don't win the Super Bowl and they end up getting flumbed on the back end like they did for parts of today, the decision to not bring back Jimmy Ward is going to be one of the more indefensible ones that, that this regime yeah. has had. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't really make a ton of sense at the time, but yeah, I, d look, here's with Jair Brown specifically. Like they let they they let Jimmy Ward walk because they were going to draft Jair Brown and he was going to be their safety next to Talano Hufanga and that's what they're going to do. He was one of two players along with Sam Darnold who was active and didn't play today. So he's either hurt or I I don't I don't know. Like if he's if he's if he was unable to play, I'm not sure why Samuel Womack is is not up, or one of the two defensive linemen that they brought up for right. the practice squad who sure. maybe could have helped stop the run. I it, it just it's a weird decision. But Shanahan also didn't say anything after the game about Jerry Brown being hurt. So I, I'm I'm at a loss. I got nothing. I got nothing for you. Yeah. Um. Do you want to talk about yeah. Jake Moody? <laughs> Sure. Look, okay, let me so, let me start. I mean, let me, yeah, let me, let me it was, start. we can talk about Jake Moody and then I want to talk about Kyle Shanahan cuz it Kyle Shanahan had a weird night. He had a bad night, dude. But real quick, Jake Moody <laughs> misses the 48-yarder because of course he did. But then drills a 52-yarder in a huge spot. The 48-yarder was blocked, but like just Okay, fair enough. He had the 48-yarder <laughs> blocked. He was hooking that shit left for sure. Like, book it. It was going low. No, so the 48-yarder gets blocked, but he steps up, 52-yarder, in a massive spot because he misses that field goal. The Packers have great field position, and they can go up two scores with a field goal. They need, like, 25 yards for a chance to go up two scores and, and, and probably put the game away in the fourth quarter. So props to Jake Moody for that, uh, making making the biggest kick of the year. 
And frankly, like that's kind of why they drafted him. They're like, yeah, we trust him in big spots. And he hadn't done it during the regular season, but he did in the postseason. That's huge. Uh, why are they not launching every kick into the third fucking deck? <laughs> I mean, so, how many times do we have to see this? How many? Uh, we've been talking about this for weeks. Like, yeah, this is weird. They do these, like, not pooch kicks, but these, like, they sky these kickoffs so they can try and get down there and, like, force a short return. Nah, man, the the field position is not worth it. Just kick it out of the end zone. The extra right. six yards you're saving or whatever is not worth it. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry for the no, F you're... word. I don't I'm just at a I'm at a loss because the next kickoff out of the back of the end zone. It's like he can do it. Just do that. I, I don't it's such a weird Kyle Shanahan has this like thing with special teams, right? And that special teams thing is um yeah, hey, just don't mess up. Like just don't just catch the punt. Just make the field. Yep, we're not going to run fake punts because we're just going to kick it and then trust our defense because that's how football works. But then when it comes to kickoffs, it's like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to try and kick it super high to give our team, our coverage team, time to get down there and then try and kick it like right onto the goal line so the guy can't just kneel on it. And now he has to bring it out. Now we can stop him at like the 16 instead of them getting it at the 25. Like, why is that now suddenly a thing? Like now all of a sudden you want to get cute on special teams? That's stupid. It doesn't make sense. Do touchbacks. Just do the touchback. Anyways. A thousand percent. Um, I know you, you had agree, the yeah. you had the you had the 73 yard kickoff um from like the Niners score a touchdown, right? They get that 39 yard run from mm -hmm. Christian McCaffrey. They retake the lead, 14-13. And it's like, okay, Niners have like a little bit of momentum. Um, after the Packers scored, right? Like the Packers, the Niners did not lap the Packers like they <laughs> have done so many times this year, right? No, they so sure they, didn't. instead of <laughs> <laughs> they they miss the field goal at the end of the first half. They go three and out to open the second half. The Packers go right down and score. So the exact opposite of lapping happens. And then the 49ers, for the first time in the game, maybe aside from the George Kittle touchdown, okay, they get a Christian McCaffrey touchdown. You're like, all right, maybe they're going to start to, you know, like put their foot down on this game and, and steal some momentum back. That was totally they how do... that felt, by the way. Yeah. And then they, then the kickoff doesn't get booted in into narnia like you said and the guy returns at 73 yards and then four plays later the packers score a second consecutive touchdown and they get a two-point conversion that succeeds right so it's just mm -hmm. and at that point it was like man the 49ers like really might lose they they really might get upset the one seed in the nfc with a bye week that's one of the most talented teams we've seen in this franchise's history, which is saying a lot, is losing to the number seven seed in a season where they haven't come back to win all year, in part because they're trying to be super cute with these kickoffs. It's bizarre. And it's It was bizarre. And fortunately for them, they won the game. But, like, you know, you give up a touchdown there and they lose the game by a score. That's a huge talking point. Yeah. Along with Kyle Shanahan's, and, and this is probably a good, a good transition into Kyle Shanahan's night. Um, yeah. They, the end of the first half sequence where Shanahan was just clearly intent on settling for a long field goal attempt in the driving rain with the kicker who's been super sketchy throughout most of the year. Mm -hmm. um, I just, just didn't like it. Like you had a play call on third and two and then you let the clock go down, and then you just burn one of your three timeouts mm -hmm. for no real reason other than, like, oh, we just want to make sure the Packers don't have the ball last. It's like, it's raining, man. Like, you have a really good defense. You shouldn't worry about Jordan Love getting the ball back with 45 seconds left and going to get points at the end of the half. Like, that's... yeah. You shouldn't totally. play scared like that. Like, go get points. You need points here. You're in scoring position. You've struggled. If you are trying to lap them, then like get a touchdown there, come out in the second yep. half, get another touchdown, and then take control of the game. And Shanahan was just content to sit on the ball, waste one of the timeouts, and still, after all that, you're settling for a 48-yard field goal in the rain that gets blocked. It just, dude, and it's, I... Go ahead. It, it, it was just, you know, that was weird. Um, we can talk about the Juwan Jennings thing because Shanahan had kind of an interesting... Um, can I answer to, to that one 
But the zone read to Brock Purdy to start the drive, that was weird. Like at that point in the game, it was like, feed Christian McCaffrey. Just feed, yeah. keep feeding him because he was rolling for most of the night. And the 49ers mm -hmm. are starting drives with a run to Juwan Jennings and a zone read to Brock Purdy. Like it, it didn't make any sense in, in the moment. Um, so I thought Shanahan had a weird night. Uh, and, you know, ultimately it didn't come back to bite them too badly, but it was not Kyle Shanahan's best night from a play calling perspective. No, I, dude, the, the, the end of the half was just a disaster. It was like, they didn't really have a plan and they got into what was field goal range. And I don't like, I don't under, I don't understand it. I just don't understand the risk reward assessment there of settling for a long field goal versus maybe giving the Packers the ball back with 12 seconds left. Like I don't, I, I just, I, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. The McCaffrey thing is, is wild because yeah, I get that they were playing from behind uh, for, for a lot of the game, but they weren't the type of behind where it's like, Oh shoot. Gotta be one dimensional now. Like down two scores. You gotta go, you gotta go, uh, you know, throw it every time. Like that's what happened to the Packers. Uh, uh, excuse me. The, the Cowboys against the Packers. Packers punch them in the mouth. They go up 14, nothing. It's like, all right, scrap the run game. It's throwing time. And at that point, your defense can just sit on the pass and you go up 27 to nothing uh, like, like Green Bay did in Dallas. It was never like that. The Niners were never at a point where it's like, dude, put the run game away. They would just abandon it for, for the McCaffrey had a drive where the Niners go two handoffs to him. He goes for 14 yards on the two handoffs. It's like four and then 10. And they gave it to him again. And I, it might've gone for a yard. He might've had no gain. So it's second and long. And then they just went pass pass again. And okay, second and long, you're probably going to throw it, but dude, run it again. Give it to your best player again. Go extended hand. Yeah, run it a little bit tricky. You. Yeah, d right. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't. I it's it's weird because we know they don't like forget that Christian McCaffrey is there. We know they know he's there, but to go for a team that's like, yeah, we want to get to thirty rushes. You, you know, thirty carries is is the number. They were at. 24 one of those was brock purdy's kneel down so make it 23 one of them was a brock purdy read option zone read thing so call it 22 and one was a handoff to Jawan jennings so i i don't i don't i i don't quite know maybe the packers are just doing something defensively where the niners are like oh god we can't run against this but you still gotta try because putting yeah. it in Brock Purdy's hands tonight, whether it was weather or whether it was the defense or, or, or whatever it was, he wasn't good. He wasn't good. I'm sorry. Like he just, he, he was bad. And on the last drive, did they get it done? Like a hundred percent totally. But he also got bailed out a couple of times. There were a couple of really nice catches on that drive on some not so good throws. So that's fine. It wasn't his night. I'm sure he'll be better in the, in the NFC title game. In fact, I would, I would bet that he is, he is better in that game, particularly if it's dry. But I, I, it was like they continue. It was like Shanahan wanted him to throw his way out of it or something. It was just an odd, an an odd choice, especially without Debo Samuel, your second best receiver. It was like, all right, hey, Jawan Jennings had a really really nice game. Um, that catch he had on third down, the leaping twenty one yard grab, was a was a game saver. But like Jawan Jennings is not Debo, <laughs> you know. Ray's McLeod is not Debo. It's just not. I don't know. Just Brock odd, Purdy, odd gameplay. Brock Purdy leads the NFL in effective lollipop throws. Dude, <laughs> that is a bar. The, That's a goddamn the, bar the, by you. The the Jennings one was just like you you see him like it it just the way it came out of his hand tonight. I don't know if it was the rain or what. It was just such a lollipop to Jennings. And then you say after a couple of replays, you're like, all right, he kind of layered it over the guy in front of him. He need to put he needed to put it up there. <laughs> but even the Kittle yes. one, like it was well placed. The Kittle touchdown was well placed, mm -hmm. but it didn't really feel like it had the same velocity that that Purdy had. Like, like mm -hmm. I think uh, about Purdy, like week one in Pittsburgh, like the back shoulder throw to Brandon Ayuk. That was like it wasn't. It wasn't a laser, but it was on far more of a line than it a and a, it's a different type of throw. I know, mm -hmm. but it didn't feel like he had any of that, any of that juice in, yeah. in his arm tonight. And I don't know if it was a weather thing, but that's what I mean. Like 
the the games where the conditions are bad are where his limitations become real limitations and you know when he's playing inside when the weather's neutral like he, then then he's fine he's not really affected but man there were some times like there were a lot of just short layup throws um that you know i think one of the strengths of Brock Purdy's game that might get overlooked just is the precision on the short throws like throughout the year he's been really good at those check down throws and giving it to guys in a position where they can make plays after the catch. Mm -hmm. And he's just missing those throws by like five yards tonight. Yeah. Um, the timing never felt like it was there mm -hmm. and it, it, he, he seemed out of sorts. The, the pass protection wasn't great. Um, Green Bay did a I good think job the, defensively. Yeah. Green Bay did a, a much better job defensively than, than I would have expected, mm -hmm. but the pass protection, still kind of leaves a lot to, to be desired. Um, you know, I, I just, you know, if it's Aiden Hutchinson next week against Colton McKivitz, that's, that's a pretty scary matchup for the 49ers. I would say at this point, like, um, yeah. and it does feel like when McKivitz is getting beaten, like Brock Purdy can see it. It's in his line of sight. Cause it's the right side. Right. And that can mm -hmm. be, that can be particularly problematic because sometimes I, I think that'll lead to Purdy hesitating a little bit or not throwing within rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, but he did get it done on the final drive. And this was as, as our favorite cast member, Nick Wagner pointed out on, on X formerly Twitter. Um, this was the first time this season, the 49ers had a come from behind game winning drive in the fourth quarter. It's kind of wow. crazy to think about. Well, yeah. I mean, if you don't win any close games, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> i guess yeah i like that i like that the the big thing to pull out tonight was uh brock Purdy has one game winning drive in his career and it was last season against the raiders <laughs> cool <laughs> cool yeah. man that's basically yeah. the same thing now i was um overall the 49ers played far worse than i thought they would um but green bay also was a lot better than i thought they were going to be um, I didn't yeah. think necessarily, especially defensively, they were going to be able to replicate what they did against Dallas, but they, uh, they, they really, really did. And, um, yeah, it was just, a man, wild ass game. I think, I think green Bay is going to be good like for yeah. a while. Yeah. I like I too. think Jordan love has a potential to be like a, a dude you can win a lot of games with. Yeah. And all of their receivers are like 18 years old. <laughs> And they, it, yeah, no, they're, yeah. they're, they're really good. And, and Matt LaFleur is, is a very good coach as we saw tonight. I thought the, the touchdown to Bo Melton with the fake screen was brilliant. Like that's just such a great play design and play call in that spot. Uh, I, I just, I said, I have nothing but good things to say about Green Bay. They were awesome. But I, I mean, yeah. we've, how many times have we talked about this with the Niners this year? Like, yeah, like even if they don't play well, their talent's just kind of gonna win out. And I think we saw that on the last drive. It was George Kittle, and there's Brandon Ayuk, and there's some Christian McCaffrey, and there's oh, there's Brock Purdy with a scramble. There's Chris Conley. And Chris Conley. <laughs> <laughs> there's Chris Conley with a huge catch. Uh, no, it's just um, yeah, I just, that that was a crazy ass game. And then Dre Greenlaw comes up with a couple of picks. What the hell was Dre Greenlaw doing at the end of the game? Dude, so everyone on the broadcast or everyone watching at home probably uh, probably saw this. Hey, but Greenlaw hey, chat, gets what the did pick. you yell at your TV after the interception? <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Greenlaw gets the interception, and then a fan right in front of the camera hold has his hat in his hand as he's celebrating with his hand up. And all you know is that you cannot see what's happening with Dre Greenlaw Nothing. and that he's not down. <laughs> that he's trying to like make something happen. And it's just like, are, will you get down guy? Like, what are you, what you're trying to score here? Like, you, are you a ball carrier now? Like if the Packers would have, would have ripped the ball from Dre Greenlaw in that oh spot my God. And, and stayed alive. Like that would have been one of, one of the worst plays in NFL history. Full stop. You can't, you, you can't, <laughs> If he had, let's, I'm going to live in the timeline for a minute. <laughs> I'm going to live in the timeline for a minute where, where he fumbles that ball. If the Packers go on to win the game, 
I don't think there's any way you bring Dre Greenlaw back next year. Like, he just can't be on your team anymore. Not that he's bad or anything like that. I just don't think you can have that player on your team because that's not Roger Craig fumbling against the Giants. What was that, the 88 NFC Championship game? 87, 80, sure. NFC Ch- whatever it was, when whenever Roger Craig fumbled. I was like, a year and a half old. Okay. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever year that was, a Roger, like that's just, okay, the running back fumbled in a, in a spot where he needed to just hang on to the ball. Like, okay, that sucks. But in a, if a linebacker trying to return a meaningless interception for a touchdown, fumbling and leading to a loss after they would have just won. Like, remember Nate Clements did that against the Falcons in 2010? Like, you just can't, yes. that, that just, oh man, that's... Oof. Boy. Wow, that's a good callback by you. I completely forgot Thanks. about that. Uh, Dre Bly, um, I believe, did it as well against the Falcons uh, a couple years before. At home, though. Good call by you. <laughs> um... <laughs> Somebody in the YouTube chat said they were yelling for a lateral. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, yeah, I mean, if you had if you had Niners minus nine and a half, you probably wanted them to return that for a touchdown. Oh, dude! I saw some people making making that joke on uh, on X, formerly Twitter. That also would have. Uh, oh my God! And if you return that for a touchdown, that also would have put the game at the over. Over was oh, fifty wow. and a half, and the final wow. total was forty five. <laughs> yeah, God. that's that's crazy. Um. I feel like the Packers probably let Christian McCaffrey score at the end there because they knew that like it their only chance to to keep the game going was to get the ball back eventually. Because you see that sometimes, but I say that to say like that was a, a great Christian McCaffrey game. Oh, it was, it was like really it felt good. like it felt like he could have had ten more carries. Um, but to have you know, 17 carries, 98 yards, two touchdowns. Um, he was the most targeted guy. Uh, he had 12 targets. He had 30 yards on 12 targets, which isn't <laughs> great from an efficiency perspective. Um, he caught seven passes. But how many how many of those runs were looked like they were going to be for zero and they wound up being for like three or four? It felt like he did right. that a handful of times tonight where he just created yards by himself. Yeah. Yeah. He was he was excellent. Um and obviously scoring the game winning touchdown on a drive where there was so much focus on Brock was, Purdy. I don't I don't want to dive super far into this, but that was weird clock management by the Packers too. I thought they would have been calling timeouts. Yeah, I get wanting to have your timeouts right. on offense, but also like I think I'd rather have like a minute and a half and one timeout than a minute seven and all three. I, I, maybe it's a, a wash, but I, it was just, I expected them to call some TOs and they didn't. Yeah. I think they were hoping to get to overtime there. Um, but I don't know, man. Are are you concerned about the defensive line? Mm-mm. No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I, I definitely, yeah, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. Because I was going to say, I don't think so because typically the Niners are in spots where teams can't just line up and run against them like the Packers did tonight. But chances are that's what it's going to look like in the NFC title game and, and the Super Bowl if they, if they win that. So, um, yeah, I definitely think that's a concern where if they can't get the other team in a negative game script and the other team can afford to run the ball, I think that there are some opportunities for explosive plays against that defensive line. Yeah, I kind of thought we would see at some point, and maybe we see it next week, um, but it just feels like, again, the Niners didn't have any sacks. Uh, Javon Kinlaw was the only guy not named Nick Bosa to register a quarterback hit. Nick Bosa had five quarterback hits. Um, but That was a peak 2023 Nick Bosa game where you're just watching, and on the surface, it's like, man, I feel like Nick Bosa didn't do a lot. But then you look at the numbers and you go back and watch. You're like, oh, he's around the quarterback a lot. I remember in 2019, there was a lot of negative discussion around D Ford because of his availability and the fact that like he had a hamstring issue. And mm-hmm. I forget what the, I think it was a back injury too. Um, and he only ended up playing like 20% of the snaps that season. 
Mm-hmm. But man, when when D Ford was playing, the defensive line was just at a completely different level. Yep. And it feels like this group, even with Chase Young, even with Nick Bosa being later on in his career, even with Javon Hargrave, um, even with Eric Armstead back, and and Armstead probably isn't close to a hundred percent. Yeah, um, dealing with foot yeah. and knee things. Yeah. It doesn't feel like the Niners' defense is designed to be dominant up front, and they haven't been dominant. They certainly weren't dominant tonight. And um, while you know, twenty-one points isn't like a huge total, um, it just felt like there were a lot of plays or, or a lot of like drives that could have gone much differently had had the defensive line make more more of an impact on Jordan Love. Yeah, yeah, man. Ma- man see. I'm interested to see if they play Dallas or not Dallas, <laughs> if they play Detroit. I'm interested to see if if we come away with the same takeaway against a quarterback that does not handle pressure as well. Because Jordan Love, like I said, Jared Goff. Yeah, and there there were there were a few times tonight where it looked like the Niners were going to get Jordan Love on the ground and he escaped and turned it into a positive play. <clears throat> and I don't think Jared Goff. I don't think you're getting that out of Jared Goff. So if the Niners defensive line has the exact same game from a pass rush perspective against Detroit, assuming they play Detroit that they had against Green Bay, I think we see three or four sacks because Jared Goff doesn't move around the pocket the way that Jordan Love does. Yeah, but the Lions do have a really good offensive line. That's also very true. It's a great point. But we'll look ahead to that once we know who they're playing. Yeah, but no, man, it was just like, I think one of the reasons why it was so jarring was because they hadn't the way that game went, that version of, of game was one the 49ers have lost like all year. Dude, a thousand and percent. The fact that, Go ahead. And the fact that it, it was that type of game, but they ended up winning was <laughs> I mean, I think ultimately like if the Niners win the Super Bowl, there's going to be discussion about like, yeah, we we like probably needed to learn how to like win sort of a weird, ugly game where we don't play well. Yeah. Because and this isn't this isn't a dig on the Niners, but like when you win so many games in dominant fashion and you're just playing really well. And the times you've got kicked in the teeth, you've just kind of folded like that can really come back to hurt you in the playoffs. Because yep. you're going to get kicked in the teeth. And the 49ers got kicked in the teeth, and they didn't play well. They committed some dumb penalties. They didn't stop the run. Um, Brock Purdy threw some passes that could have been picked. For sure. The fact that Brock Purdy didn't have an interception tonight is kind of wild. Um, Man, that's But shocking. it was it, it was just one of those – like, there were a lot of things. They, they missed a field goal, right? They, they were – they did the opposite of of lapping the Packers at the end of the second quarter and early in the third. <laughs> and yeah, it was sure just did. and they they still won the game. So like if if they do go on to win the Super Bowl, I do think there's going to be value in the way this game went as sort of a confidence builder, a learning experience going forward. Yeah, I'm super interested to see if this was a precursor to them getting steamrolled in the NFC title game where (laughs) they are just, they, they hit one of those stretches like in week six through eight where they just kind of inexplicably struggle. Or was this a, Hey, haven't played a meaningful game in three weeks. Welcome back to football. Here's a team that's playing really well in the green Bay Packers. And they got just kind of, punched in the face a little bit woke him up and now they're going to be a buzzsaw the rest of the way i think those are the two options i think there's a chance i think they lose next week or they win the super bowl i think that's what's going to happen <laughs> i think they either lose next week or go to the super bowl <laughs> wow that's, thanks man that's interesting um yeah i don't know i i think i mean we'll know more you know, to the the one thing Shanahan did say about Debo Samuel's injury after the game mm-hmm. was that it was similar to the one in Cleveland. Um, and the injury in Cleveland forced Samuel to miss three games, and then he had the bye week before he came back. Right. So Samuel had to miss a month the last time he had an injury like this. 
Um, and obviously, you know, by the time you're listening to this on Sunday, maybe Samuel will have, will have gone through some more testing and we'll have a better idea. But, you know, you kind of worry that after getting tested and, you know, I think they had some imaging done for him just to be out like to come out in the second half in a hoodie is not a promising sign. Maybe he can play through it. Uh, But, you know, to not have Debo Samuel in the NFC championship game would be a pretty, pretty substantial blow. Um, But at least the Niners would have a week to, to sort of prepare in that scenario rather than losing a mid game when like he had two touches, it felt like it was going to be a big Debo Samuel game from the jump. Yep. Yep. Any return that might off, which, like, let's just stop, dude. Just getting cute. Let's just special teams don't matter until the third round when you got to pick a kicker and the kickoff. <laughs> it's just I like. I'm obviously Debo Samuel is generational when it comes to like being a guy with the ball in his hands. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that we've seen from him in the NFL that is suggested like, oh, you know what, we gotta have him back there? returning kickoffs we he's have had it. A, like he's, he's had a, like a couple of like okay broke. returns he's had a couple of okay returns and he had one a few weeks ago that he almost broke but it's not like he's devin hester back there <laughs> no i know like right i would rather take the ball at the 25 and then run a trick play to get him the ball on first down well just like he has shoulder issues he had a shoulder issue earlier in the season like why do we need to risk like high impact his Debo Samuels, unless he's like has a has a penchant for returning kickoffs for touchdowns in the NFL, which we've never seen before. Has never I know he was in college, but like this is it's it's just completely unnecessary. I don't get it at all. It's why you have Ray Ray McLeod, your fourth receiver, available. Like let let him return kickoffs. Yeah, dude. I don't I don't get it at all, but. It, I, I'm with you though. It, Shanahan even talked about it in his post game presser, like losing Debo Samuel mid game changes a lot of what you can do schematically. A, right. you saw it with the handoff to Sean Jennings. <laughs> B, when Ray Ray McLeod goes in motion, it doesn't affect the defense the same way it does when Debo Samuel goes in motion. But we saw the Niners offense struggle really bad against, against Cleveland when Samuel went out and granted they were missing Trent Williams too, but against Minnesota, moving the ball wasn't a problem against the, against the Bengals, moving the ball wasn't a problem. Their defense was a way bigger issue in both of those games. So what you said, I think is, is spot on. That's kind of what I was circling back to is if they have a week to game plan without Debo Samuel, if he, if he's going to be out, we don't know that yet, but if they find out tomorrow, okay, he's out next week. They have a a way better chance to um, figure out a game plan and how to move the ball without him than they do mid game, where hey had a massive script ready to get the ball to number nineteen and now he's just not in the game anymore. So let's figure it out. Yeah, you still have Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, and Christian McCaffrey. Like yeah. that that would be plenty for a lot of teams. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and Trent Williams um, still, on, by the way. Right. Uh, on the Juwan Jennings run, because uh, I was fascinated to to see that Kyle Shanahan got asked by, I think it was Grant Cohn, um, about that play. And what do you Shanahan not trust said, Jordan Mason? <laughs> what Shanahan said was, um, he basically the play call was just a number on Purdy's armband. But there was there was an adjustment. It's like this play call, like 41 or whatever, with a, he called it like a hezzy, like an, I don't know what the adjustment is, but I'm guessing whatever the adjustment that Shanahan called was not like Purdy did not do like when he called the play to his teammates. So I think in that spot on the wristband, I'm assuming that's a Debo Samuel handoff. And what Shanahan said was like, we Ron Burgundy, Ron Burgundy did it. Like, remember the, the scene where Ron Burgundy yeah. reads the, he'll uh, read the whatever's on the teleprompter. He'll, he'll read whatever's on the teleprompter. Yeah. Shanahan has a term for it. He was like, we Ron Burgundy did that. And so Purdy ends up calling the play that should be for Debo, but because Jennings is in the, in the game, he lines up in Debo's spot and, uh, and it didn't work. 
So oh. I guess that explanation is a little bit better than like Shanahan being like, oh yeah, let's uh let's give Juwan a, a carry here. <laughs> like, it's first in Juwan, baby. Let's go. <laughs> but, but I don't know, you know, again, and, and there was a zone read for Brock Purdy. It's like it at, at this point. It, it felt it, like it they were throwing like, just a kitchen sink at Green Bay and figuring out if something would work. But it was it, it just wasn't like, oh, like Brock Purdy, like you're really gonna catch him off guard with a Brock Purdy zone read. <laughs> I love right, that to the wide I love, the, I love the idea that Shanahan's calling that and he's like, We're putting this on tape. We're gonna make sure teams <laughs> prep for this. <laughs> Juwan Jennings handoff. Yeah. Um Jennings was good though. I thought he, he had a good game. Really freaking good, man. Um Brandon Ayuk's catch, the diving one on third down oh, on the last drive sick. was was one of his best catches of the season, particularly given the moment. Mm -hmm. um, a contested and, diving catch is gnarly. Yeah. Um, and Chris Connolly's play was huge, obviously. That was really big on that drive. Um, and it's kind of wild that the 49ers are at a point where Chris Connolly is like making a, a huge catch, one of the biggest catches of the season, but he made it. Um, sure did. He was open. So, yeah, like it was, it was a very ugly game. It was a C minus D plus performance. Some breaks went their way. Um, and you know what? You advance, and that's all that really matters. And if you can, if you can win a game with a, C minus D plus performance, like you should feel pretty good about just the overall quality of your team. But to win a championship, you need to be a hell of a lot better than they were. Yep. And I That's think it. that I think they have a pretty clear understanding of that. Yeah, two things, two things can be true here. You can you can say, hey, a win is a win. Win's a win. No such thing as an ugly win. No such thing. It's a W. Moving on. Like that's a hundred percent correct. And that is the largest takeaway of all this is the 49ers are playing next Sunday. But on the other hand, it's what you just said. That's great. They're going to play next Sunday. That is the goal. That's the better than not playing next Sunday. But they cannot play this same game next Sunday. Because if they play no. this same game next Sunday, they will very likely lose. Yeah. Brock Purdy needs to be a lot better. Way better. Like way better. Um, Kyle Shanahan needs to be better. They they were making great. Uh, Greg Olson was making the point and what like comparing Brock Purdy to Jimmy Garoppolo and other 49ers quarterbacks that Shanahan's had and saying, you know, Shanahan really trusts this guy to be in shotgun and go empty. And it's like, man, I get it. You can do a lot more in the passing game and you can be really efficient. And yeah. you have, you know, a lot of really good eligible receivers out there. I totally get it. But it always feels like when the 49ers are at their best, they're building the passing game off the running game. And you do most of that when you are under center mm -hmm. and you're doing the boot action and you're doing all that stuff. I don't think Kyle Shanahan is as good of a like designer of a downfield passing game from shotgun as he is like designing running plays off play action or designing pass mm -hmm. plays off play action and sort of tying everything together. And when you're constantly in shotgun and spreading the ball out and going empty again, like Kyle Shanahan has forgotten way more about football than I'll ever know. I'm not trying to say I'm smarter than Kyle Shanahan, yeah, yeah. but I, I think when you're trying to mask a quarterback's deficiencies and when the weather is as it was today, when you can be more balanced and you can throw different looks via play action and with the running game, I think the Niners are a lot more difficult to stop than when it's just like, Hey, we're going to be an empty and you're going to know that they're throwing it. And you know, you're asking the offensive line to hold up against a pretty good pass rush. When we know the offensive line in pass protection has been average to below average all season and i think that's probably being a little bit generous right mm -hmm. um i am concerned for the 49ers about that like if their if their plan is just going to be to rely so heavily on brock purdy and shotgun and going empty you're asking a lot of your offensive line and you're asking a lot of brock purdy whereas you can give him a lot more 
you can give him a lot more layups mm -hmm. by utilizing play action in the boot game and the running game. And at the same time, you're giving Christian McCaffrey more touches. Yeah. I knew it was going to be ugly when his first downfield throw of the game should have been a pick six. Like, it feels like when that happens, the team is just dialed into whatever the 49ers are going to want to do, and they don't have a great adjustment for that in the passing game. I also think that might have thrown Purdy off a little bit, too. He seemed a little hesitant to let it rip down the field. There are some comments um, in the in the YouTube chat. People saying, like, it was raining like crazy. You couldn't really... It didn't feel like the rain was super... I, I think when the rain was coming down, it was coming down really hard at the game. And I think mm -hmm. it might have had more of an impact than maybe it seemed just watching it because it wasn't yeah. like puddles were forming. It wasn't like guys, yeah. I mean, guys were slipping, but it didn't look like a monsoon. It didn't look like but they I gave do in Washington the rain, in 2019. Right. But it did look like the rain had a, like, I think the rain had more of an impact than it looked on TV. Yeah. I think maybe I agree. It's the second time this year they played in a wet game and Purdy has been bad in both of them. There's two worst games of the year. Yeah. So, yeah, anyways, so I've got a. They asked, uh, they asked Jimmy Johnson at the end of uh, in the post game show, oh, who you think? I think Brian Menefee asked um, Kurt Menefee. Kurt, Kurt, Kurt Menefee asked him. He's like Jimmy, who who the Niners playing next week? He's like, well, it's going to be the winner of the Lions or Bucks. <laughs> wow, he said that. It was like, <laughs> it was like, whoa, the yeah, hot Jimmy, take culture has gotten out of hand. <laughs> We we know Jimmy. Like, who do you think's winning that game? <laughs> oh, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, but All no, right. I I I'm with Jimmy in that. I I definitely think the Niners are going to play the winner of of Lions Bucks. I'm fully I would be, on board. I'd be floored if they played somebody else. <laughs> There's like, oh no, Dallas oh, is back. Is that the Cowboys music? How about them Cowboys? How about them, huh? Um. All right. I, I don't think I have anything else right now. You want to do prize picks real quick? <laughs> I have to. It was ugly for your boy. It was better for you than for me, but you're you're trying to win it all back. Um, <laughs> prize picks. Daily Fantasy Sports. It is the single best way to uh, add a little spice to your, uh, to your enjoyment of your sporting events. I'll run through my list first. I went with Aaron Jones. So what, what prize picks is with daily fantasy, you don't play like a million other players and you're not playing against like sharp guys or bots or anything like that. It's just you, you pick two to six players. They have stat projections. You pick more or less on the stat projection and you let it rock. Uh, we're supposed to say, then you watch the winnings roll in. But if you're following me and Chris, the winnings or are you're not fading me. rolling in at this point. If you're fading us, you're probably stacking cash right now. Um, they also do Apple Pay for deposits, uh, which is great. But anyways, uh, Aaron Jones. I had Aaron Jones more than 69 and a half rushing yards. Nailed it. He went for 108. Uh, I had Jordan Love more than seven and a half rushing yards. No dice. He went for three. Debo Samuel more than 16 and a half rushing yards. He had zero. Brandon Ayuk more than four and a half catches. He had three. Christian McCaffrey, more than 22 and a half rushing yards in his first five attempts. He had 22. One for five. That's not going to give me any, that's not going to give me any money. That's tough. What did you take? Um, so I had, I, I wrote mine down. Yeah. Uh, and I cannot find where, where I wrote them. I know I've I got had them right here for plays. you. Oh, yeah. perfect. So you I know had... I had the demon play for Brandon Ayuk. Yeah. More than 99 like, yeah, and a half yards. yards. Yeah, thirty-two. Yeah, more, yeah, more than yeah, just just shy, just just short at thirty-two yards. You had yeah. Brock Purdy with a fantasy score of more than nineteen. He had twenty-five, two hundred and fifty-two yards and a touchdown. I don't think that's going to get it done, bud. Yeah, I needed that one more score. Yeah, yeah, you sure did. That's like sixteen. Yeah, his fantasy score is like seventeen or so. Uh, and then you had George Kittle more than 79 and a half receiving yards. He had 81. Good call by you there. Along with the, uh, along with the touchdown. Great work by you. One for three. It was a power play, but you know, it's fine. Like at some point, one of these 
payouts that pays you know 13 and a half x or whatever it is is going to hit you're this and close. i'm going to be in the green yep. and that's all it's really going to take <laughs> yeah. Big swing. Sure. yeah scared um, money don't make money we are what due it, that's what I we're chasing say. losses all yeah. the uh all the smart gambling tips out there come nope, find that's me. not what it is <laughs> nope that's no, not, not what we're gambling doing. no it definitely the, uh, isn't it's daily fantasy, fantasy dog it's come on it's daily fantasy yeah right but if you different. were gambling in some other platform in some other place right. where it's right. legal, right? Um, don't follow my advice. Yeah, but daily fantasy sports, man. Uh, it's the best, and you can join us at prizepicks.com slash candlestick. Use promo code candlestick for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. That is prizepicks.com slash candlestick. Promo code candlestick for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, uh, can't wait to watch Bucks Lions. Who do you think is gonna win that one? I'll tell you um, what. Well, I'll tell I think you th- the winner. Oh, go ahead. You do it. You do the joke. <laughs> We're gonna say the same thing. We're gonna make the same joke. The winner. I, I definitely think the winners. The winner is gonna play the Niners next week. That's um, good call. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take the Lions. I just don't think the Bucks are that good. I think the Lions are going to boat race those dudes. Okay. I'd I'd believe it. Like I wouldn't. That wouldn't shock me. Um, man, it would be hell of a, a hell of a moment for Baker Mayfield though if they if they pulled it out. I'm rooting for it. I would love to. I would love it for Baker, but I just the Lions. The Lions feel like a buzzsaw right now. You have Dan Campbell crying and telling his guys that he's gonna like go to war for him and all this other stuff. Yeah, Anyways. we'll see. Right. We shall see. Who do you like in uh, Kansas City Buffalo? I think Buffalo's gonna win. I think Buffalo's getting them this time. Like at some point, Kansas City's inability to score a lot of points is going to be a problem. Yeah, maybe. I think there's a pretty good chance Kansas City ends up going to the Super Bowl again. Okay. Sure. I know the Ravens look really good, but... The Ravens looked awesome today. Yeah. Just defensively, they are dialed in. I was way more impressed so with them what, defensively than I was offensively. What the Ravens did today was what I thought the Niners were going to do to the Packers. Mm, pulled away. In like the almost to a, yeah. Almost to yeah. a T, but yeah. didn't happen. Um, all right. We will talk this to you guys later fun. in the week. Hit the thumbs up. If Maybe you're in the video, hit the thumbs up, please. Yeah. We would appreciate the hell out of that. Thanks. Oh, do we you maybe just did it. Thank to, you. Do we maybe want to do a quick one tomorrow? After we find out who the 49ers are playing in the title game? Oh, you and I are going to have to talk about that separately. Offline. Okay. We'll yes. Chat. Yes. We'll um, chat. Appreciate everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be out this week. Chris will be on with somebody, I guess. Uh, we'll we'll have Perfect to figure week. it out. Perfect week for a little vacation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> again, we can talk about it offline if you want. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to blow up your spot. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um Yeah, no. So Chris will be here. Stay locked in. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. See you guys. Bye.